So good. So good. And uh, isn't it great to just uh, hear how active the church is, you know, still through all of this time, just throw back to some of the stuff. And uh, it, there is more stuff happening on the website. So right off the bat, let me throw you back to the website because there's things like young adults nights that are going to happen soon this month. There's things like uh, we got a, a camp that is in the planning center. It's, it's being like fused together. Uh, that's happening. We've got so much great stuff happening in the church. So just jump onto the website or ask one of us. We're happy to talk about the life of it and it's great. Um, let me tell you a story to start off this morning because that, 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 uh, that Bible reading is juicy. It's big and we got a lot to digest in that. So hopefully this can help frame where I'm approaching it from for you this time. Back when I was in, in year 12, back in school, I, uh, I used to go to this private school in, the, in the, my final year. I went to a lot of schools, but in the final one, managed to get a scholarship and I entered into this private school. It was a sports scholarship, sports and music. But because I was in the sports world, I was able to uh, wear the sport uniform a lot more often than the regular people. And the school was very strict about having the uniform. You know, that's shirt, pants, belt, shoes, bag, hat, tie, and you had to be tucked in. It wasn't, and you had to wear the bag on both shoulders. It wasn't just one shoulder. So, you know, by the time we started to do all this stuff, a lot of us kids just didn't care. And, you know, we, we, uh, I managed to get away with it a lot because the sport uniform was just this comfortable, like, running shirt and running shorts and, and white shoes. Still, still traumatized by it, but I had to wear that. And, uh, what happened was a lot of the teachers, because they noticed I was wearing this uniform a lot more often than the other one, they say, Caleb, why do you wear that uniform so much more? Now, the thing was, I was playing sport a lot more because I was involved in about 12 of the school's sports teams because that's a way to get out of maths class. And, uh, you know, it was a good way to be able to uh, be involved in the life of the school too. So I was able to get away with it because I was actually active and participative. But the thing is, when we went to that school, we chose to live by the standards that that school set for us. So when we say we want to be a part of what you have to offer us, the education system, their requirement was you have to wear a uniform. And that's just one of the things they had in place. There was a whole heap of things they had in place, you know, don't walk through the gardens. Makes sense. Now, the thing is, when we have the Christian life too, really we should be stepping into those things that God calls us to. And it is a little bit harder sometimes because there's active forces trying to pull us away from that. Uh, and there is things in, in, that's happening where, oh, maybe that one doesn't fit as comfortably with what I like. But just because it's there doesn't mean that it doesn't apply. And so what we got happening here, and particularly in this, ver this, this story that we read this morning, is we actually have Jesus correcting some of the ways the disciples are thinking about things, and we're going to start to explore it. But firstly, let's just pray as we go about it this morning. Lord God, please open our hearts uh, and our eyes and our ears to hear the word. We pray for an incredible encounter with a spirit, and we pray for our hearts to be convicted in a really powerful way. Amen. Amen. So as I said, this morning, it's an extremely insightful and helpful for us as a church and as individuals, this reading. And when I first read it, and, and when I saw it, I looked at it and I was like, this is a lot of gobbledygook. You know, there's just a whole heap of like random thoughts here, a whole heap of teachings and all these famous quotes that I've heard. Uh, all in like five to 10 verses. And, and you start to put it together and we're reading it through and we're reading it through with the context of all the Mark because we've been working through Mark. And we start to say, how? How does that fit? I don't know about you, but I'm reading that and I'm thinking, wow, Jesus is teaching this all in one moment. What's the point? And it's a really powerful lesson that he's teaching them. We know that, uh, you know, there's stuff like infighting, children, exclusion and temptation in there. But it's far more than this. This passage actually it brings us back to the point where, where we begin at. Where we are at. And then what happens is it reveals what's wrong with us. So there's a conviction there. And then it identifies the sin underneath that. So there's, a, there's an extension, if you think of it like that. And then it gets to the root of it. 
And then it gives us a picture of what the results could look like. And this is kind of what Jesus is getting at with these, these teachings. So let's start by, we'll look at the packet, this passage, and let's begin by asking, what does this passage reveal? And what's wrong with us? What's this passage reveal and what's wrong with us? So we're going to start in 33, please, Chris. And we've, we've reached the part of the gospel where Jesus starts to focus on the majority of his attention on training the disciples because we, we've gone to that turning point in Mark now where it's not so much about establishing but saying, I need to start acting because my time's about to come. And so Jesus is saying to his disciples, I need to teach you so that you can take on from when I've left. And, but he knows there's some serious character flaws with them there. And this is what he's addressing. So we've got, they came to Capernaum where he was in the house and he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took, no, we'll just stop there actually. Must be the very first and be the servant of all. Now, this is shocking, isn't it? You know, normally it's like, especially if you think in an empire sort of way, power, power, that's the one who's going to be first. We are usually, we are not usually so blatant as the disciples though. You know, not in our context. And we're shocked when people admit to this. But there's this cartoonist by the name of uh, Ashley Brilliant. It's a good name for a cartoonist, isn't it? And uh, he, he's an author also. And he spoke these words when, uh, when he was talking about something along these lines. And he says, let me just pull it up for you. He says... All I ask of life is a constant and exaggerated sense of my own importance. All I ask of life is a constant and exaggerated sense of my own importance. Now that starts to make more resonance, doesn't it? And if we're honest, we have to admit this is our problem too, don't we? This is our problem. The disciples were following Jesus. They understood that Jesus is the Messiah and they just came down from the transfiguration, the Son of God. And this means that they were closely connected to the Deliverer. And wow, what a powerful spot that is because what are they going to start to do? Oh, I bet I could actually start to put myself in a position next to Jesus that's going to get me a higher elevation. They're not dumb. They know, they recognize, and they're starting to work their way because Jesus has already called Port Peter the cornerstone. Uh, and so he, they're starting to try and like manipulate their position. And that's what they were arguing about. Who's the most important? So the, really the first issue that we come to deal with is self, self-absorption. I'm the greatest. The world revolves around me. Even though we're not the center of the universe, we still think we're the center of the universe as Earth. The world revolves around us. All the heroes want to, in, to save Earth and all the villains want to come and invade Earth. But we're not. We're not self-absorption is not the way of Jesus. When I was just a wee boy, when I used to play soccer on a, a uh, Saturday morning. And... Uh, The best part wasn't the game. It was after the game because what happened was the Premier League coach would always watch us because we were leading up into that age bracket and there was always a reserve spot on the bench. And what would happen was the person that played the best in the game got to sit on the bench for the Premier League squad. The best part of the game was never the actual result in our league because we all wanted to be recognized by that coach. We all wanted to be identified. We all want them, to someone to say, who are you and you must be somebody. We crave the status and approval of others and we desperately want to be on top. Even at the expense of others. And this happens among Christians as well. I don't know if anyone's read of someone called Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Edwards was a theologian and he's a pastor in America. 
In one of his writings, there's a story about how his wife actually encounters a divine spiritual development encounter. And actually, this is what she said. She says uh, that if a visiting preacher came and God really moved through that visiting preacher instead of her husband, she would be okay with that. That for her was a massive identifying factor of God's humility in her life. Let me say that again because it's somewhat relatable. If there was a visiting preacher that came and God really moved through that visiting preacher, she would be okay with that. That's the first problem, self-absorption. You know, I heard that story back when I was in college and I thought, you struggle with that, you spiritual midget. No, of course I didn't. No, I could relate. And I thought, we all struggle and we all struggle with being self-absorbed. So this is the first lesson that we got from that. The second problem is very closely related and it's judging others based on our own insecurity. Judging others based on our own insecurity. It says, teacher, said John. This is verse um, 38, thanks, Chris. It says, teacher, said John. We saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in, your name, in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. Literally because he didn't want, to, uh, he was not following us. Notice that back then they said, he's not following us. And look, back in the time, let me give you some contextual understanding. It made sense they were kind of worried about it because back in the day, there were a lot of exorcists and they, they used to use any deity's name to be able to cast out demons. And so they would actually start to take uh, on the role of anyone. And so for the disciples to be concerned about using Jesus's name in a non uh, a way that Jesus would desire it to, they had some right to be concerned. But I don't really think this is the main motive here. And it's something that covers up the actual motive. If we read the issue comes out and it's hiding something, the man was a blow to their self sense of identity. Really. This person that was sending out demons in the name of Jesus was actually a blow to their sense of identity and it undermined their special status as one of Jesus' disciples. They had just failed to cast out a demon, remember? Remember Jesus came down from the mountain and because of that, when they met the disciples at the bottom, they were shocked because they couldn't cast it out. And that's where we make reference to the prayer and fasting. Jesus says it's important to have these in place to be able to do, cast out these types. So they've got this overwhelming sense of jealousy because they're hearing it, they're doing it and he himself can't do it. So they make that statement. It wasn't, primarily, it wasn't out of a primary concern for Jesus, but it was to cover their own insecurity. If we look at it a bit closer, we say, why don't you talk to the, um, we look at it and we say, why doesn't he follow us? Now, why isn't it that it doesn't say, Jesus, they're not following you? See, so often we get caught up in the, the team mentality that we become insecure because of our position, our value, and our, our right to the area that we're involved in. But really, it should always be and needs to come back to, I'm a follower of you. See, if the disciples came back and said, look, Jesus, we're concerned about this person casting out demons, demons in your name because he's not following you. It might have had a lot more appropriateness because then it's about concern about Jesus. But because it's they're not following us, it's strongly showing the fact that it's about their position and their status. So their own self-esteem, their own insecurity is actually what's being highlighted. You know, this, this isn't just churches and stuff. It can happen in individuals too. 
Let, let's think about something that might happen for real. Uh, say, for example, someone has a change in them or a change of the way they do stuff, the way they think, and they actually stop talking to you. Have you ever had that happen? Someone just stops talking to you randomly? Haven't you heard I just can't agree with the way they do X anymore? They can't just be themselves around you anymore. The real reason, of course, is because they are a th- you or they are a threat to your or their identity. And this is why it's so important to have it strongly grounded in the truth that Jesus gives us. Let's come to the third issue that, that we're going to talk about today. And it's this, not taking sin seriously enough. Not taking sin seriously enough. If you read verse 40 to the 48, 48, you won't help but notice the over-the-top language that's used. Cut off your hand, put a, a, a anchor on your neck and send him to the bottom of the sea, gouge out your eyes. Now, it's very intemperate language and we wouldn't expect it from Jesus. And there's a reason for it. Jesus is using a hyperbole. It's a fancy English word for us, hyperbole. He's, using, he's exaggerating beyond because he wants us to get how dangerous sin is for our soul. Now, he does, because it says elsewhere in the scripture, and this is why we know it's hyperbole, that it's actually forbidden to do self-mutilation and stuff like that. So that's why we know it's an English tech, or it's a technique of language to be able to exaggerate like this. And so Jesus is standing there and he's saying, you have to treat sin with the same regard and prevention of sin that you would as if you were to cut off your hand, be something that would cut off your hand. It has to be to the same regard as if you'd put something around your neck and go to the depths of the ocean, or you would be something that gouges out your eyes to prevent you from stepping into hell. So Jesus is actually saying that this is how seriously we need to take sin. And if we do not take it so seriously, then we're actually not going to have healthy spirits. And we tend to minimize sin and its effects. We think it's no big deal, you know, because we have the blood of Jesus and we're just going to get forgiveness. Uh, we, we do not take the necessary steps to eradicate and then start preventing sin in our lives when we know it's an issue. We tend to tolerate it, wink at it, think it's not a big deal. Jesus says it will destroy us. Jesus says it will destroy us. And that dealing with these areas is more important than even the things that are indispensable to us. Dealing with these areas is more important than the things that are indispensable to us. So we look at this passage and it's putting its finger on, these are the three problems that characterize human nature. Self-absorption. Waiting to be noticed, wanting to be noticed, wanting to be somebody. We put others down and make it look good when the real issue is actually our own insecurity. We don't take, take our sins seriously and we're far, we're far too ready to tolerate things that can destroy us and destroy others. As a result, we have bickering and exclusion and patterns of sin that are unnatural that they're, and they're nurtured. It's not a pretty picture. And why does this passage put its finger on these issues? It's because they're the characteristics of a pattern of behavior that reveals an underlying problem. And this is the second thing to note from the passage. So we've got the three aspects. And here's the real healer. At first glance, we said, this looks like absolute chaos and it's unrelated issues. And it almost seems like anybody who's controlling uh, so confronting you and listing all these different things off, be like a shopping list. And there's just like, just stop and just name one thing. Stop listing all the things. Well, if you look carefully at the passage and you realize that Jesus isn't dealing with a grocery list of sins, under all of these sins is one underlying problem, one underlying sin, if you would. There's one underlying issue that shows itself in our pride, our judging of others and our willingness to tolerate sin. 
What do I mean? Well, as we've been studying Mark carefully, remember back in chapter 8, Jesus predicts his death for the first time. Well, if we compare the two, there's actually a pattern that starts. He corrects the mistake that the disciples are making. And then he clarifies, so he predicts his death, he corrects the mistake, and then he clarifies what it means to live in light of his suffering. And this is what we're going to explore. In other words, the fundamental issue is a failure to understand that we serve a Savior who went to the cross and who invites us to follow him in his suffering. It's a huge issue. And another theologian, I've used more resources in this one than I have ever, I think. But another resource, a name by uh, Ajith Fernando. He's a pastor, theologian, and writer. He says, I think one of the most serious theological blind spots in the Western church is a defective understanding of suffering. There seems to be a lot of reflection on how to avoid suffering and what to do when we hurt. Uh, We have a lot of teaching about escape and from a therapy for suffering, but there is inadequate teaching about the suffering of theology of suffering. Christians are not taught why they should expect suffering as a follower of Christ or why suffering is so important for healthy growth as a Christian. Do you know why the disciples were struggling with all of these problems? It's because they hadn't yet grasped what Jesus was going to do. They thought Jesus was a victorious conqueror. They had no category for a Messiah who would suffer and be killed. If we read in 9 verse 30 to 32, it says, They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know what they were, where they were, because he was teaching his disciples. And he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered over to human hands. He will be killed, and after three days he will rise but they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. The fundamental problem that the disciples had was they failed to grasp the cross. And the cross as not only a path that Jesus would take, but the path that they were called to, to take as well. It wasn't just something that they failed to grasp Jesus was going to do. It was something they failed to grasp as something they were going to do as well. You see, if they had understood that Jesus was walking on ahead to a sacrificial death, they would have realized how ludicrous it is to push and shove to establish the order of the placement, of procession behind him, if you would. When you're marching to a cross, you stop pushing to get to the front of the line. <laughs> If they had understood that Jesus was laying his life down in service by going to the cross, they wouldn't be threatened by somebody casting out demons who wasn't part of their party. They wouldn't be threatened by someone because they're servants. They don't get threatened by that. A servant looks to serve. And if someone else serves, that's just part of the team. They are worried about their position. They are worried about serving. If they understand the lengths to which Jesus would go into order to offer his life for them, they would understand the seriousness of sin. Not only the seriousness of sin, but the fact that Jesus has come to restore them from that sin. It's the same with us. Whatever issue we are facing, whether it's envy, anger, sprite, spite, Maybe it's, you know, gluttony. Maybe it's, uh, it's jealousy. Maybe it's, did I say pride? Pride. Whatever your instance is, if we understood the point of the cross and the point of living in the cross, then none of these things would actually be something that concerned, that actually challenged us, that concerned us, that made us live a way we do. The main problem then in the Christian life is that we have not thought deep about the implications of the gospel. We have not used the gospel in and on all parts of our life. And when we understand the cross and we understand what, that we've been called not to only 
enjoy the benefits of the cross, but to follow Christ in, the, in His life and suffering, then becoming transformed in that way, it's not until then that we actually live the fullness of the cross. So I'm just going to invite Kerry up as, onto the keys as I wrap up. The thought then is this, what would it look, what a close look at this would happen if we lived in this way? What would it look like if we actually lived in this way? Do you know where this would really work itself out? You could have a, have a guess. Well, if we lived in this, online, try in the chat. Get it before I say it. If we lived in this life, really, it would work itself out in our relationships. It would work itself out in our relationships. There's a character in a novel and it says, they say this, I love mankind, but the more I love mankind in general, the less I love human beings in particular. I'm a- unable to spend two days in the same room with someone else. No sooner is that someone else close to me than his personality hampers my freedom. In the space of a day and a night, I'm capable of coming to hate even the best of human beings. One because he takes too long over dinner, another because he has a cold and is perpetually blowing his nose. Can we relate? If we're really shaped by the gospel, it will affect the way we live in community. So according to verse 35 to 37, which is talking about the salt, we'll stop worrying about our own status and we'll become servants to all. Even into an infant, which in those days, an infant, a child, was not romanticized. That's something that's only happened recently. Before, when they were in those days, the children was just seen as something that was insignificant, it was dependent, it was, un- it was vulnerable, and it was unlearned. It brought nothing to the unit. They consumed and demanded more than they gave. But Jesus says that when we are shaped by the cross, we'll stop worrying about our status and we'll willingly serve even the last and the least. The disciples are threatened by that rogue disciple. But Jesus throws open His arms and welcomes not only rogue disciples who claim His name, but any of those who do the smallest task, even provide a cup of water. When we see ourselves as servants and we understand how Christ has welcomed us, then we'll be be ready to welcome others as well. Everyone will be salted with fire, is what it says. Now, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with each other. What in the world does that mean? What? What does it mean to be salted with fire? There is one place where salt and fire come together. And this is something you need to know when offering a sacrifice. Back in Leviticus, when God's telling His people how to offer sacrifices to Him, He says, season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings. What Jesus says here is that following Him is like making your life a burnt offering. It's total and irrevocable. Then He uses salt in a different way and He's referring to the preserving and purifying qualities. So first of all, He's using it as an offering and then the preserving and purifying qualities. When we maintain our saltiness, He says, we will be at peace with each other. There won't be fighting and quarrelling and we will be at peace with each other. Jesus calls us to live a cross-shaped life of humility and service. There's so much wrong with us, but we'll never deal with the sins until we get to the underlying issue of becoming a cross-shaped life. And when our lives become cross-shaped, we will live lives of humility, service, and become a community of people transformed by the Gospel. Let's pray and come into worship. Lord God, Bring to us right now these these thoughts, these these emotions, the things that tug on us that actually make us feel like we have something to change. 
put those words so strongly in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, so that we will have the opportunity to react. God, make our lives cross-shaped. Make it something that makes us desire to live like You. Make it something that's seen by others and says that's someone of humility, that's someone of grace, of community, that's someone of Jesus. Amen.